setting conflict and subsequent refugee crisis. How do we solve the Syrian conflict and subsequent refugee crisis? Now, uh, Tommy, you're going to find this very difficult because you're up first and time is ticking away already. So I'm going to ask for as brief an answer as you can give me on how we solve the Syrian conflict and the subsequent refugee crisis. You're going to highlight that it's impossible in a small contribution to give justice to a question of such importance. But the reality is, Western interference is the cause of the Syrian conflict. We have a situation where the media plays a very important role in Western propaganda. There is an old saying that truth is the first casualty of war. And that is absolutely a wise statement. We have a situation in a place like Aleppo where you have effectively a group of individuals who the West refer to as rebels bombing communities and assaulting innocent civilians who happen to, according to the most reputable polls that are available, support the Assad government. We might not like the Assad government. We are the Assad government. We have lots of relations with the Assad government, the same way we did with Saddam Hussein before we fell out there, the same way we did with Colonel Gaddafi before we fell out there. And that's the problem with international relations, isn't it? It's riven with rank, stinking hypocrisy. Because the reality is the people who are being armed as rebels in Syria would be called terrorists in Iraq because that's the way the West likes to compare and contrast. They label individuals not according to any principle but according to Western interests. So from my point of view, the solution in Syria is to get the hell out of Syria and to stop interfering in other countries' affairs. And for those in the Westminster Parliament who wanted to bomb Syria, some of them ought to be the ones that volunteer to go and live in these communities that have been bombed. We bomb communities and then we wonder why people turn into suicide bombers because they've lost their families. They've lost their families by being bombed in these international countries. We wonder why they become refugees because they're trying to escape the horror of being bombed. So from my point of view, I think we have to get out of Syria, we have to get out of Libya, we have to get out of Iraq, we have to get out of Afghanistan, stop interfering, and perhaps while we're at it, give the Palestinian people what they deserve, and that's their own yeah. nation. Yeah. You were so passionate there, Tommy, even your microphone was struggling to cope with some of that. Jackson Carroll. Uh, the answer to the question is honestly, I don't know. Uh, I don't know how we resolve the Syrian conflict. And I'm very, very fed up of hearing from people who are very certain that they do, because all these people who are very certain that they do are the people who have brought us to the point that we are now at. Uh, measured, persistent international diplomacy, uh, yes. Uh, I remember that the House of Commons and then the United States voted not to intervene in Syria. And I know that it's President Assad and Russia that are currently at war with the people of Syria. Uh, I think it's a, a, a shameful position. I think it's shocking. Uh, but actually, I've lost faith, frankly, for the moment, in the international community and the certainty of politicians who say that they know, because as far as I can see, their great conviction and knowledge about what we should do has led us to the mess we're in now. Christy. I don't really know either, but I'm applying to study international relations. I might be able to give you a better answer in four years' time. Um, I think we can all see the airstrikes are affecting above everyone else civilians. The last hospital in Aleppo has just been destroyed. People are going underground and yet 
bunker bombs are now being used, so underground orphanages, underground hospitals are being destroyed. A no-fly zone is impractical because that requires UN or, or American jets to patrol the sky above Syria and risk clashes with Russian jets which could click up, um, sorry, kick off something far worse than the situation we have already. But what we do need to do is sit down at the table with Russia, who clearly have influence over Assad, who are playing their role in the Syrian conflict, as we are and as America are, and work out how best we can protect civilians, because, frankly, all sides are equally bad in this conflict. Um, what we can do, though, is help the refugee crisis. We clearly haven't played our share so far. We've accepted 187 Syrian refugees. That's pathetic. We promised to let in 20,000 by 2020, but the Home Affairs Select Committee is already saying we're not going to hit that target. We've helped refugees in the past. We helped the Vietnamese boat people in the 80s. We helped them become part of our communities. We can do that for Syria, and frankly, the UK should be ashamed of not doing more. Thank you. It is a, it's a terrible situation and it, it, it's hugely complicated. It, it's not something that I could ever support. Um, it's absolutely, I think, imperative though um, that, that contrary to, to Jackson, um, Jackson's point where he said that the politicians you know, they this and they that. We are politicians. We do need to take responsibility in these situations. It, it, And, well, I, I, as I said, I certainly didn't support that. So it is a mess. It, it's a mess. And now we need to deal with this mess. There were 13 countries, I think, at, at last count bombing Syria. That is a devastating situation. The people that are there are suffering hell on earth. There are children, women, completely innocent people being killed every day with no end in sight. So our role really should be focusing everything that we can on trying to get people around the table to support some kind of sustainable peace initiative. And I think that we do, as Tommy said, actually need to have much more scrutiny in terms of arms and in terms of more non-direct military issues as well. Sometimes the, the UK is guilty of suggesting that it has no locus in a situation when very clearly it does have arms that it has sold or support military staff in these areas. We, we really need to think very carefully about how we deal with that. And in terms of the, the refugee crisis, I couldn't agree with Kirsten Moore. We need to do far more. There are people in areas all over East Renfrewshire, in areas all over Scotland, and I'm sure there are a few in the UK, who are stepping up and doing great things every day to help refugees. Why on earth is the UK government not doing more? We have room. We should help these people. What if it was us? If we were in that situation, fleeing from hell, would nobody help us? Because that is exactly the situation the Syrian people in are in, and we should be ashamed that we are not doing more. Yeah, I agree with a lot of it's been said. There's obviously very complex issues in, in Syria, and, and there are no easy solutions. Uh, lives are being lost, some of the scenes we see on the television. Are, Truly really horrific. Um, it's clear the answer to bloodshed isn't, isn't more bloodshed, and we need to try and find, if possible, a political and diplomatic solution to the problems that are being faced there. But it is a very complex issue, and I don't pretend to have um, you know, any of the, the answers of how, how, how we solve it. But in terms of the refugee crisis, it is clear, and I would absolutely agree with what um, must be said um, about. Um, the need for a greater response to that refugee crisis. We need to make sure that we get aid onto the ground, aid to the, the refugee camps, to try and um, you know um, help people um, in those situations. But we also need to take uh, much more seriously our responsibilities. And we, we um, I know there's been good work done by, by East Renfrewshire Council and North Renfrewshire Council nearby as well, taking on. Um, a, a significant number of, of Syrian refugees, but we, we can and should do more. I also think, in, in addition to that, it's also important because you see some of the, the, the scenes at camps in Cali and, and others that um, 
a lot of EU countries need to tax the state property. The responsibility is serious as well. There's been a lot of countries that are quite happy to see refugees go through um, to try and get to the United Kingdom or, or Germany, but aren't taking uh, Germany back to them and been quite good in terms of, of, of taking on refugees. But there's a lot of other EU countries that could be doing uh, more as well. And I think we all need to um, be doing what we can to support uh, people who, who need it. Can you imagine if it was any of our families were in that situation? Um, we would be looking for help, and it's absolutely right that, that we and other countries step up to the plate on that. I was just about to say I was going to do more than a gentle reminder. It was just um, that question had two parts to it, and Jackson, your parties in government in Westminster, you didn't address the refugee part of the question. Would you mind? So, if you repeat the refugee part of the question, then. how would we deal with the, the the subsequent refugee crisis as a result of the Syrian conflict? Right. Well, one of the things that the UK government has done is we have one of the highest levels of international aid of any of the developed nations. Um, and I think that's a good thing. My concern is that we need to be able to nation build back Syria as a country. And that is why I talked earlier about measured persistent international diplomacy. Because an ultimate solution is not that the whole population of Syria leaves Syria and become economic or refugees across the rest of the world. That's not sustainable. I think that the refugees that we do take, it's very important that we take them from the source point. I'm very concerned about the number of people who have actually been exploited by international people traffickers and who have been dying on the beaches and seas, being transported across, having invested a huge amount of hope in people who were never ever going to do anything other than exploit them. And so the most important thing to me is that we take people from the source point who we think we can offer the most assistance to. And I think that has to be part of an international community. It's not the responsibility of the United Kingdom alone. But ultimately, uh, it can't all just be about showboating tactics. We have to be prepared in the long run to invest in the rebuilding of Syria. And to get to that point, we first have to end the conflict. And that's the bit that I'm afraid I just don't see. Despite what Kirsten says, I accept the responsibility that we all have. The problem so far is that politicians who have sought to bring about that end to the conflict there in order that any nation can be rebuilt have so far singularly failed. But we need the people, the talented people of Syria to be there to rebuild that country at the other side of this conflict. So it's not just about identifying where we put and where we take refugees. I've got no difficulty actually as an individual in bringing a fair share of our refugees into this country. Do I think we've stepped up to our fair share? Not particularly. And we've said that as a party in Scotland, we think we could take more. But we can't take everybody, and so the problem, no matter how many we take, will remain and will persist until we actually draw an end to the conflict and then invest in allowing the nation of Syria to be reconstructed so that the people of Syria want to go back and live there. Question and question back to come back in while we were talking, Jackson. Um, that, that's really interesting what Jackson has to say, and I think it is undeniable that there are so many people in Kerala and the need out there that we can all take everyone. I don't think that that should be our starting point for any decision making process, so these people are not coming here because of pull factors, they are coming here because the push factors, i.e., terrible war in the, their country is giving them absolutely no alternative but to get here. And to suggest that people should somehow uh, suffer some kind of penalty for having taken the initiative to get out of there while they could, uh, I, I think is unfortunate and uh, I, I'm not quite sure where these people are supposed to go. They've fled war, they've made it so far, Let, let's take our fair share of that responsibility too. But I, the, the thing that I really wanted to come back on was your comments about the uh, investment in the rebuilding of Syria. Um, reconstruction, you said. The UK government's um, record in this is absolutely dismal. We spend so many more times on obliterating places um, in that area of the world than we do on reconstruction. 
That is wrong. It's skewed. It's not going to help us to go any further forward. It, it's a fact. We have the highest international aid budget of any of the developed nations. And perhaps if, if we use less of our funds to uh, take military action without investing some of the international budget in reconstruction countries, then we'd be in a significantly stronger position in terms of our international relations. Naive drivel isn't going to solve anything. <laughs> The reality is we're spending more on international aid than any other developed nation, and we have to be prepared to invest in the rebuilding of the country at the other end. You and, and you heard it here, Jackson is committing the Conservative you Party to a change you in their policy. And then maybe we should come back to her as well, Jackson. I just wanted to ask you a direct question. You said we should take refugees from the source. So what on earth do you propose to do with the huge number of refugees who are already in Europe? I'm not going to argue here today that all the people who are making their way across the European nation from Syria can come to the United Kingdom. If that is your objective, then I'm afraid I don't agree. I think we can take a fair share. But I think for as long as we give those people who are exploiting those people who are moving across Europe the expectation that they can get here so that we see people drowning in our oceans, do I think that's an acceptable solution? No, I don't. So yes, I think we should be giving a tremendous amount of aid to the countries neighbouring Syria so that they are able to support those people who are uh, seeking to leave Syria. But I don't think it's a solution. I don't think it's a practical solution. I don't think it's a long-term sustainable solution to simply try and argue that they're all going to be able to come to the United Kingdom. And it's very easy to sit here and talk in water... I, I hear a lot of watery, florid nonsense from the SNP on all of this. It, <laughs> we have to deal in the absolute realities of this. We are, and Kirsten wanted to talk in facts, we are giving more internationally than any other country, and that is a good and admirable thing, which we have sustained despite the economic consequences of the last few years. I'm not arguing that that is enough, but I think that is a starting point. And Neil Bibby has now asked to come back in on this topic. Yeah, I think this is an important issue about international, international aid budgets. Um, I should... Uh, to be fair, Jackson is right, the United Kingdom does spend a lot of money on international aid, that, 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 is, that is correct. Um, I should add that when the last Labour government in power from 1997 to 2010, we massively increased the international aid budget. And to his credit, uh, David Cameron, under, despite pressure from Conservative backbenchers, actually um, protected that budget. However, I would say there is a concern now that some of the international aid budget is is although the overall figure has been kept at, at the same level, that some MOD expenditure, some climate change expenditure is all being um, covered as part of that overall budget. So the original intention was that that would all be spent by different, on different projects. So I just think we need to be, yes, but we are spending a lot of money on international development, we need to make sure that it is for the purposes it was originally intended to help people on the ground, to provide aid, but also to help countries develop, to grow, uh, so there is sustainable development in, in, in countries like uh, Syria and the other countries that we're helping across the world. I thought it was interesting with Jackson Carlow then accusing other people of talking dribble uh, in terms of this, and I'm, it horrors me that I'm starting with the SNP on this one. But to say that there is a, you know, the biggest international aid budget, it's in a very poor lead because international aid numbers across the Western countries is appalling, whereas spend on uh, armament is very high. So to say that we're the best at a very low level is not giving us much acclaim. You know, the, the, it is not dribble Jackson car law, it's a fact. We need to do more. Um, why? Why? In a very rich country, our families with two working parents just about managing. We'll come on to, we have a social issues end question coming up towards the end, so what we'll do is we'll include that within that, if we can just stay on topic for just now. Um, our next question comes from Rachel McGrory. Will closing the attainment gap have a damaging effect in Scotland's top performing schools? I'm going to remind myself that I'm chairing and not a panel member on this question then. Will closing the attainment gap have a damaging effect on Scotland's top performing schools? Jackson Carlow, please. 
No, I, I don't see why the closing of the attainment gap would have a, an effect on uh, top performing schools. But I think what we ought to be seeing is pupils irrespective of where they live in Scotland being able to participate in top performing schools where they happen to live too. Uh, those people who live in East Renfrewshire are tremendously fortunate. We have got the biggest concentration of top performing state schools in Scotland. Uh, we have a very engaged parental body. We have a very committed teaching staff. We have a lot of pupils who do an awful lot of after hours additional study and work in order to achieve those objectives. But we have to recognise that for far too long, uh, where you live and the circumstances of where you live have a wholly prejudicial effect on your education and your future uh, opportunities. And actually it starts before you go to school because if we were able to invest far more to reduce health inequalities and to ensure that we had a preventative agenda, many of the difficulties which prejudice people when they get to school have already been established in their early years. So we need to invest more in reducing health inequality. We need to invest more in seeking to have a preventative agenda for young people so that when they get into school, they have the opportunity to close the attainment gap. Now, all of the political parties in the Scottish Parliament have been arguing for and supporting initiatives to ensure that the attainment gap is closed. It means a whole raft of different ideas. To be fair, the First Minister uh, has responded to suggestions from all different sides of the Scottish Parliament in embracing the policy that she is pursuing to secure the attainment gap. But I mean, this comes after quite a long period of the current government being in office and not achieving anything significant whatsoever in terms of reducing the attainment gap. So what we now have is an identified need. We have a parliament which is united in its objective of having to achieve this. Uh, and I think it's absolutely right. It shouldn't be that you have to move to East Renfrewshire to be able to say that you have got the best possible chance of attending a state school which is going to give you the equivalent opportunity of any other person in Scotland. And we are getting it, it shouldn't, it, the closing the attainment gap should be about um, lifting people up, lifting children up, uh, rather than bringing in any other children down in their, in their educational attainment. Obviously, as Jackson said, East Renfrewshire does have the best schools in Scotland, best performing schools in Scotland, according to exam results. Um, but, right, but right across Scotland, and I'm sure in East Renfrewshire as well, there are big issues in our education system. Um, numeracy and literacy standards um, have fallen, according to the latest um, Scottish Government statistics. Literacy and numeracy and standards have fallen uh, amongst, uh, amongst young people, um, leaving primary school going into the secondary school. That should be a wake-up call to that. should be a very alarming uh, figures indeed. And we need to ask ourselves, why is that happening? Why is numeracy and literacy standards falling in this country? And there will be a number of reasons for that. Um, there has been a lack of investment in education over the past 10 years. There's 4,000 fewer teachers in Scotland schools since 2007. That's an enormous figure to take out of uh, the education system in this country. To tackle the attainment gap, we need to make sure that children are being supported and, have, uh, and, and teachers have more time to spend to give that tailored individual uh, support. Um, and because teachers are, are teacher numbers have been cut back, teachers have got ever increasing workloads, uh, a lot of bureaucr bureaucracy, and we do need to um, make sure that we, we are investing in education to, to address that. One of the things that I think is very important is um, in terms of the attainment gap, I read a study recently that showed that some families in Scotland were paying up to £2,000 a year for private tuition for their, uh, for, their, for their children at school. And I'm sure some of you here will, will, will have had private tuition from time to time out of school to help you in camps. But there's may, very many families who can't afford to bring in that private tuition. They can't afford to and help them uh, at, at exam time. And that's why we need to invest in education so that every child has the opportunity 
to get on in life, to get the grades, to, to make the most of their talents. Um, and yeah, absolutely, we need to pay for that. Um, there's no point just complaining that we need to spend more education. We do actually need to spend more money on that. And that's why we should be looking to use the tax power that we've got, whether it be income tax, to put on an extra penny of income tax to raise significant sums so that we can protect education, help children uh, fulfill their potential. Not, not just because that's good in its own right, but because in order to grow the economy, in order to create the jobs in the future, we need to invest in young people uh, today. And, and I think um, you know, we, we absolutely should be investing to close that attainment gap, and that should be about benefiting all our Scottish people so we can benefit the economy and the country as a whole. I think it's a, a really interesting question. I think it, it goes to the, the heart of what our priorities are. Um, and it's really interesting for me, particularly, I came um, into politics a year and a half ago from working in education. Uh, and I've seen at first hand the really powerful impact that education can have on the lives of young people. Uh, I, I did also really like what